By the mid-1990s, over 50% of public housing nationally was located in high poverty areas. As a result, this began to lead to the decline in the maintenance of public housing. Federal support for public housing began to dry up in the 1970s, so maintenance began to, um, the repair of public housing began to decline. There's a new documentary out right now about the Pruitt-Igo projects in St. Louis. They were the first ones to be demolished and actually really kind of were, said what would happen to the, in the future of public housing. So by 1992, the federal government commissioned what was called the National Commission on Severely Distressed Public Housing. Partially, public housing was distressed because the federal government had stopped funding it, and the rents weren't enough to maintain the properties. Um, and as a result, that commission said, uh, we need to demolish 100,000 units of public housing nationally. These units are severely distressed. It's more expensive to fix them up than to demolish them, and the plan was to demolish these public housing units. In 1998, the Housing Act of 1998 rescinded what had been a rule in public housing whereby if you demolish one unit, you have to rebuild a new one. So this, re this repeal of what was called one-for-one -one replacement made it possible for the HOPE-6 policy. HOPE-6 was a policy began to, quote, um, lessen concentrations of poverty by placing public housing in non-poverty neighborhoods and promoting mixed income communities. So the contemporary policy, the contemporary buzzword around public housing policy is mixed income communities as represented through HOPE 6 and most recently under Obama as represented in what are called choice neighborhoods. That's the replacement to HOPE 6 under Obama. Under HOPE 6, $6.5 billion had been granted through various HOPE 6 programs across the country. And of the 100,000 public housing units to be demolished nationally, 20% or nearly 20,000 of them are here in the city of Chicago. So many of the units in the city of Chicago, as you all probably know, have been demolished, with the majority of them being in the high-rise public housing, the, the developments like the Cabrini Green development, the Robert Taylor homes, the Stateway Gardens, Henry Horner homes, and so on and so forth. In 1998, the plan for transformation, which went along with the National um, Commission for Severely Distressed Public Housing, the plan for transformation began, uh, and it laid out the demolition, as I mentioned, of nearly 20,000 public housing units, and that demolition would only be, respond, would only be um, after the demolition, they would only replace a proportion of those units, such that Chicago has witnessed a um, an actual loss of 14,000 hard public housing apartments. Now, many of those families have gotten what are called either Section 8 vouchers or now called Housing Choice vouchers, but in terms of what we call hard units of public housing, actual apartments that are managed by the Chicago, Chicago Housing Authority and that we know will be available for low-income residents, meaning it's not at the whim or the discretion of the landlord or some other um, public-private partnership, we've lost 14,000 hard public housing units in the city of Chicago. So let me just give you a sense of some of those developments. Um, I already mentioned Lake Park Crescent, where there had been 702 public housing units, and now it is being reconstructed. It used to be Lakeland Properties, now it's Lake Park Crescent, as a total of 500 mixed income units. So of those 500, only 25% are going to be public housing. So whereas there had been on that land at 40th and Lake Park, whereas there had been 702 public housing units, there will now be about 125, about 150 public housing units. Another example is, I think I have Henry Horner next, um, West Haven Park, right? Another example is West Haven Park, which is on the west side of Chicago. It's replacing the Henry Horner homes, and I'll talk a little bit about these name changes as well. It's replacing the Henry Horner homes. One of the positive things about this transformation is what can happen when people organize and people represent themselves and make themselves heard. So at the Henry Horner homes, the residents got together and they said, basically, we will not be moved. They got themselves legal representation and they were able to maintain a much larger presence in the West Haven neighborhood than in many of the other public housing transformation sites across the city. On the south side also is the transformation of the Ida B. Wells home, 
where there had been 3,000 public housing units at about 39th and the lake, there now are going to be 1,000 public housing units, with the other 2,000 going to middle income and upper income folks, what are often called modern income and market rate, with that market rate being basically whatever it costs to buy a home on the lakefront in the city of Chicago, which is usually to much higher income uh, residents. So across the board, nationally, in the whole country, we're basically through Hope 6 um, developments only bringing back online about 40% of the public housing units that we're demolishing. So this isn't just a Chicago story. Indeed, perhaps it's even more severe in places like Atlanta and New Orleans, especially with New Orleans after Katrina. Uh, it was like a, a frenzy. Basically, look, everybody's gone now. This is our time to demolish this public housing. So the fight is particularly acute in New Orleans. So let me, um, I guess, just summarize some positives and negatives because I do want to be clear that um, many of the, there's been some early research on these new mixed income communities. And for the public housing residents who are able to move into these places, because there aren't a lot of slots and it's not like, most people who have lived on the, in the developments can move into the new places, but for the people who do get to move in, they're by and large happy because they get new apartments, it's well landscaped, this is brand new construction, um, and so for the people who get to move in, it's a very good deal, um, and it's a very nice place to live, and they, they are living in subsidized housing, and so I want to emphasize that that is what we want. We want decent, safe, affordable housing for working families, so that I think is a positive. It's also had some impact on surrounding neighborhoods with there being some new opportunities, new institutions, new commercial uh, offerings in these neighborhoods. But the critique is really that do we want a country where in order to get a grocery store, in order to get a bank, in order to get some kind of commercial strip, that you have to bring in upper income people? Because of course we know poor people shop, poor people have to buy clothes, poor people have to buy school supplies, poor people have to buy milk and bread and butter. And so these businesses, we should think about other ways to incentivize these businesses as opposed to having to, to displace some people in order to make room for others. I have a lot of other critiques, but I'll stop at that one. Um, so let me just wrap up by talking about what we can do now and what opportunity we have. So I have been uh, watching and working with the folks at the Lathrop Homes on the north side of Chicago. So for those of you all who don't know, the Lathrop Homes is a 925 unit public housing development at Diversity and Clybourne right along the lake and nearly off the Kennedy Expressway. It is right now nearly empty after years of systematic de-occupancy by the Chicago Housing Authority. When the Lathrop Homes was first included in the plan for transformation, it was claimed that the Lathrop Homes would be renovated, just like the development I studied on the south side of Chicago that was also planned to be renovated. You will recall I began this talk by saying, sure, I'm paranoid, but am I paranoid enough? The Lathrop residents can very well say that. In the very beginning, it was promised that it would be renovated 100%, 925 units of public housing. The contemporary plan, and there's a development team already lined up to do it, is to make it in the mixed income model, just like all of the developments, all the rest of the developments in the city of Chicago. That means a place that one third of the units are public housing, one third of the units go to moderate income families, and one third of the units go to market rate families. You will recall I said this is at Diversity and Clybourne. So we're talking market rate units upwards of million, a million dollars. We're talking in the middle of Lakeview and North Center and nearby gentrifying Logan Square. This is not a place that you need to encourage market rate housing. Indeed, if anything, to make that place a mixed income community, you better keep some poor people around or there's not gonna be any mix of incomes because we know how fast that place is gentrifying. So at Lathrop Way right now, we all have the opportunity, indeed they have a Facebook page called Preserve Lathrop if you want to get more information. Lathrop right now, we have an opportunity to say this kind of cookie cutter model isn't always the correct model. And at Lathrop, it most definitely isn't. I could go on and on about the uniqueness of Lathrop, actually. It's actually always been a mixed race development as well, which is not the case in most of Chicago public housing. And most importantly, you have a dedicated, um, courageous,
courageous, committed group of residents and resident leaders there who are wanting to preserve labor. And it's them that we need to support. So I'll end there and open it up for questions, comments, responses.